All right, back for another, uh, I guess we're calling it this a vidcast, Eric. Uh, Oklahoma <laughs> Sooners vidcast. You can check it out visually or via podcast. However you consume the content, we'll provide it here at the Tulsa World. I'm Garen Emig, sports columnist alongside Eric Bailey. He covers the Sooners for us uh, and continues to uh, keep his uh, eyes and ears to the, uh, the ground when it comes to all things OU football, even as we uh, tick towards February. We'll have signing day to talk about Eric soon enough, but for now, it continues. To, the focus continues to be on both the Sooner staff and the Sooners roster. Um, maybe it'll be easier to start with the roster this week because another high-profile departure occurred, or or maybe it was at Latrell McCutcheon. It's not so much his departure, it's where he's going that got a lot of OU fans' attention. Well, when you look at Latrell McCutcheon, if you remember, his father tweeted out kind of his dismay with the Oklahoma football staff during the season, and you really felt like no matter what, he wasn't going to be in Oklahoma because they weren't happy and of all things, he turns out going to USC, which really surprised a lot of people because it, it just seemed like he didn't play the second half of the season at OU, uh, very limited action. And then he ends up going to, with Alex Branch uh, to USC. And there was a little bit of a Twitter beef, too, on, on online with Nick Benito. Uh, kind of, you know, if you read between the lines, you knew who Nick Benito's tweet was directed at. But he talked about players talking bad about coaches and they ended up following him. It's kind of what Latrell McCutcheon did. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, another defensive back gone from the Sooners, but it, it's one that really didn't play a lot, and uh, you're seeing a lot of de- an influx of defensive backs now uh, through the transfer portal coming to Norman. Right, and the the, the issue with McCutcheon specific to uh, SC on the heels of Mario Williams' decision to to go out to uh, to Southern California is it just prolongs it prolongs the divorce, for lack of a better term, does it not? That's a great way to put it. You're right. Every time someone goes to USC or really whenever USC is mentioned for anything, uh, Oklahoma fans take notice because they're, they're not going to easily forget what happened with Lincoln Riley leaving and going to Los Angeles. I think it's one of those things where if a player goes out there, definitely uh, it, it gains traction and it, it restarts, reignites everything. You know, you can go a couple of days without thinking about SC, and then when the Terrell McCutcheon makes his decision, it, it opens those wounds again. So it's kind of what we saw this week, and, uh, you know, you get an idea that's probably not going to be the finish of it, too. I think it's Oh, no. Be- oh. oh, no. Every time anyone sees the USC football Twitter account post one of these, this is the, you know, the, the this is their signal out at yeah. SC, the V for victory or whatever they, whatever they call it. I, I know when I see it. I don't know what they call it. And the assumption moving forward is that must be for Caleb Williams, right? And it, maybe that's the one for Caleb Williams. Maybe I should put it that way. So when when do we see the USC this for Caleb Williams is my question to you. It's funny because remember, I don't know if you remember last week we were talking, what do we know by now, by this Friday, would we know what he was going to do? And here it is. No, we're going to put off another Friday. It's crazy because, it, you know, everyone's kind of following what he's going to do. The last I heard was USC and LSU. Which would be interesting if LSU. Did. Yeah, USC and LSU are the two that I'm noticing. Or someone had mentioned that too. I saw that gained some traction on social media. So LSU would be a school to keep an eye on too. What would it be like if you're Lincoln Riley too? If you, you lose out on Caleb Williams and you lose out on Jackson Dart? I mean, it's it's really interesting. If you're Mario Williams, you're wondering who's going to throw me the football. Uh, so there's a lot there. And Caleb Williams uh, is getting deeper into the spring semester. It's one of those things where you just wonder when the decision is going to be made because it's starting to impact a lot of schools. All right. You mentioned Jackson Dart. That's the kid that transferred out of USC, which a lot of people assumed was a sign that Caleb Williams was transferring into USC. And now he have, uh, he he's as much on OU fans radars as Caleb Williams, because he's the, it's essentially uh, a trade in the works. What, where, do, where does the, where do the Sooners stand on, on that kid? It's funny. It's almost like a domino effect. You're waiting for everyone to make a decision. And, you know, for Oklahoma, school started last Tuesday. So they're three, four days into the semester now. Of course, you can always enroll in school a little later. You know, you got to do, there's a deadline coming up though, when the kids have to enroll in to be a part of the spring semester. So I think that's, that's the date that everyone needs to watch. Uh, but with Jackson Dart, you know, Ole Miss has always been the school that Oklahoma really seems like it's competing against for him. And and if you're Jackson Dart, the, the things I'm hearing is that it's one of those things where does he want to come to Oklahoma or Dylan Gabriel really has a head start because he played under Jeff Lubby's system at UCF. Uh, and, and Dylan Gabriel is an outstanding quarterback, too. W- would it be an open competition? Would he come to Oklahoma and have a chance at the starting job with Dylan Gabriel already understanding the playbook? 
and, and uh, really no one levy. And you know that's fair. It's a fair question if you're if you're uh, someone like Jackson Dart, you want to make sure yeah. that you have an opportunity to compete for a starting job. So I think it's just one of those things where he's really weighing all his options and making sure he makes the right decision uh, and, and goes to the school that you know he really thinks he has a chance to play. Now, uh, if you're Oklahoma, an Oklahoma fan, you'd love to have both of those quarterbacks, Jackson Dart and Dylan Gabriel, because they're outstanding quarterbacks. They're proven commodities. And then you have a, a, a true freshman quarterback in Nick Evers who can, can learn this system and learn right. through older quarterbacks. So if you're an Oklahoma fan, you'd love to have both of them. But I think it's just a, a measured approach by Jackson Dart to make sure that Oklahoma is the right fit. Uh, with all that being said, there is a timeline. We're going to have to wait and see what happens. And, you know, we, we talked about Chuba Purdy last week, and he's going to Nebraska. Uh, I think he just jumped off the train, and he got tired of waiting to see what was going to happen. So he needed to find a home. So he's at Nebraska now. Uh, so uh, and someone that Oklahoma could see maybe as early as next September up there in Lincoln in the game up there. So it's just weird talking about all this quarterback shuffle, Garen. Let me, let me and I hate to do this, so i got one more question to ask about the quarterback shuffle, and then we'll, we'll move on. You, Dart and OU and Ole Miss has been the speculation, right? That's sort of where this seemed to be headed, a choice between the Sooners or, or, or the Lane Kiffins. But then BYU entered the picture this week? Is that right? That was, that was a surprise visit. Yeah, it was just a spur of the moment. You know, of course, Jackson Dart's from Utah. And, uh, you know, BYU, there, there's a lot to be said about going to BYU and throwing the football and being in the Big 12 in a couple of years, too. Right. It's not just going to a school that's, you know, nationally known and a national known independent. It's a team that's going to be a Big 12 school pretty quick. So I think that – and like I said, to be fair to him, he's going to have to weigh all his options, and that is an option. I mean, that it's an opportunity. you got to make the right step. The next step has to be the right step, after, especially after spending a year at USC. So – you know, who, who knows what BYU has to offer? That might be the best opportunity for him. And you, you got to really be, be smart about your next step. And I think that's what he's doing. He's making sure he has all his, uh, his eyes dotted and his teeth crossed. Sure. This might have been the week, Eric, that, that the, uh, the Sooner fan base transitioned away from Brent Venable so much to, to the rest of the staff and focused specifically on the, the man who I usually the strength and conditioning guru is the man behind the scenes. I don't know if Jerry Schmidt is behind the scenes <laughs> when it comes to what he's doing in his first off season back from Texas A&M back with the, his old program in Norman, uh, I, I, judging again from social media pictures and video, this he's about as embraced as Venables right now. Do you, do you get that feeling? You know, I can't get enough, Garen, of the videos and the pictures. Every time I see a new one up, I got to watch it. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how, how that, what the work he's putting them in week one. I mean, here we go. Here, you know, it's starting now. And, you know, I was always impressed with the job that he did before he left and before he went to AM when he was on Coach Stoop's staff. And now, I mean, he, it's almost like it's reinvigorated him. He's ready to go. He's doing a great job. Those, those players are embracing it. I don't know how much they're embracing it because it's a lot of work. But I think that's that that kind of what's needed. You talk about that bridge to the past. Brent Venables was that bridge to the past to championship teams. Jerry Smith's the same way. He, he's that bridge to the past through offseason workouts. So yeah, I'm getting a kick out of watching all the videos, seeing all the pictures, seeing the social media tweets from the uh, the current players and even the former players. I think the yeah. former players are having more fun than anyone because they remember they lived this. A lot of them for three and four years. They've lived the life, and so they're they're just wondering what the current players are going through, and they're kind of kicking back and kind of smiling right now. We're and again, we're to the point with regard to what Venables is doing that it really is support staff. It's it's not immediate staff that he's that he's fill, filling in because that's been that's essentially been filled in. It's assistants and analysts and GAs and and quality control guys or whatever they're calling them nowadays. Um, the one name that I think caught some attention this week was, was a departure. And that's because he wasn't just, a, again, a behind-the-scenes staff member of, of some real value the last few years, but, but was a very important uh, player and, uh, and literal uh, anchor for OU's offensive line in the mid-2010s. Uh, and that was Ty Darlington, right, deciding to leave uh, the Sooner Nest after being in Norman, gosh, eight years, I think, when you go back to when he arrived as a player, eight or nine, to, uh, to go back to his home state of Florida to join Billy Napier and the Gators. It's such a good guy. I mean, coach's son. I mean, you look at uh, Apopka, Florida. I think that's how you say it, Apopka, Florida. Yep. 
but yeah, coach's son grew up around the sport. Great football mind, great mind overall. I mean, he's one of the smartest guys. You know, he won. He basically won the Warfel Trophy, and uh, uh, he was the recipient of the Campbell Trophy, which is the academic Heisman. So this guy is not only a great football player; he's a great mind. And I think if is what he's going to want to do, which it appears to be like what he wants to do. Hey, the guy's the limit for someone like that. And if you're an Oklahoma fan and you hate to see him leave, but you really wish him the best because he's really spreading his wings. He he gave a heartfelt goodbye to Sooner Nation on, on social media. I, he, he's going to bleed crimson and cream. He really meant a lot to this program, and this program meant a lot to him. So I'm anxious to look forward to seeing what he does at Florida, you know, not only as an analyst, but also just, to, you know, when he does get into coaching, he is someone who's going to get into coaching pretty soon. And I think if you're in Oklahoma, that's a name you're going to follow for years to come. He could be like a Calvin Thibodeau or, or you know, someone like that that's going to come back to the program eventually in years to come, a Joe John Finley, you know, a Kel Gundy even early on. He's yeah. a guy going to really watch on. And, you know, who knows, uh, 10 years from now, we could see him walking the sidelines coaching at his alma mater in some, some, stat, in, in some way. I used to talk to Joe Castiglione about Darlington because right before – this wave of, of re, uh, redetermined athletes' rights and, and, and protocols and, um, you know, whether it was NIL or uh, cost of tuition or, you know, redefining what, what's allowed and what isn't. Darlington was sort of on the ground floor of that when, uh, toward the end of his playing career with the Sooners. And he would represent OU and the Big 12 Conference at a lot of the conventions where that kind of stuff was just sparking up. That, that kind of talk was just sparking up. And I remember speaking as much to Castiglione about his future as I did Bob Stoops. And the assumption with Joe was that the guy's the future star in administration. So I'd even offer that if coaching were to dry up for Darlington and he didn't fully catch the bug, he could transition in a heartbeat because of his academic background and his administrative experience, even as a player at OU, he could transition in a heartbeat to, to the front office, so to speak. That's another path I think he might follow. It's so. funny. You think about the center position, man. You had some brain. Gabe Eichert was an outstanding student, and uh, he used someone else that could go into administration, too, I believe. I mean, that center position, some of the, some of the best student athletes uh, Oklahoma's produced in the past couple of years have come through that spot. Pretty good players, too. Creed Humphrey leading the Chiefs into the uh, second round of the playoffs right. this weekend as, right. uh, as a potential all-pro right out of the gate. So, all right. Um, hesitate to leave OU football behind because I'm afraid we're going to miss something. But I wanted to make sure we spend some time talking about Porter Moser's uh, basketball program coming off a, uh, a tough loss to Kansas, coming off a tough loss to TCU. And so we are at a uh, I'm not saying we're, uh, we're anyone's in panic mode. Not saying that uh, you know the alarms are going off all over the Lloyd Noble Center, but a that is a tough stretch, and you you worry a little bit about not just not closing out close games, but morale that that creeps in after not closing out close games. But b survival in the Big Twelve Conference, which is tough for even elite teams this year. You don't want to be slipping into the middle of the pack, knowing that you still have you know three quarters of your season of the grind left. And so this this feels like a pretty critical time of year for that program. It really is. They have a tough game on Saturday against Baylor, uh, you know, number five team in the country. They're coming off playing number seven. Uh, you know, they've lost three in a row. They lost four or five. And we talked about Baylor on Saturday. They got West Virginia to go to Morgantown, which is not an easy place to play. They go there Wednesday, and then they got number two Auburn on the road next weekend. This is a tough stretch of basketball. They could go three weeks without winning a game easily. I, I know Porter Mosier, though, he, he's really got that team kind of fired up. They were close. They, they, you know, the Kansas game, you know, it's not decided until the last 11 seconds of the game. You're at home. You got a good crowd. You fought your way back into that. That was a tough loss. And you're right. Morale's the big thing. I mean, they got to get over the hump and win in some of these close games. I mean, the TCU game in overtime, they fought back to get it to overtime and then to fall in overtime, just a couple of defensive lapses, both in TCU and KU. Uh, it really shows how much you value each possession because there were some key stretches of the TCU game and the Kansas game where those teams executed. And Oklahoma probably could have played a little bit better defense on both ends on certain situations. I think Porter Mosier probably points that out to his team. So, uh, but the big key is, you know, you got to rebound. I mean, you got Baylor at home. You can't really uh, stick, stick around licking your wounds. You got to get ready for a tough Baylor team on Saturday. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of team shows up tomorrow. I finally got around to writing about college basketball midweek for the world, Eric, and focused on, on Moser and, and the Sooners 
not just specific to the loss to Kansas, but just to me, I'm, I'm, I'm almost to the point of sort of accepting the reality of, of this season. And, and again, I'm, this isn't to say that they're going to finish below 500. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. And overall, they may finish below 500 in the Big 12 because of the Big 12. But this starts. This is starting to remind me a little bit of Lon Kruger's first year in, in transition post Jeff Capel. Kruger left the Sooners in a better place than Capel did. I'm not. I'm not making an apples to to apples comparison here. But there was a transition, right? And Kruger sort of had to manipulate the roster and figure out which direction to take it. It was a mix of holdovers and and transfers and new players. This is even more of a patchwork, I think, when you consider who Moser has brought in and, and tried to mix with Kruger's holdovers. And the reality is that you can you can coach the bleep out of a team, but if if the if the ceiling is only so high to begin with, uh, you're 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 it's essentially you're you're in a position where you got to accept that this is transitional. And that if they can if they can win more than they lose in the Big Twelve, and if they can go to the NCAA tournament as a, even a ten seed, you've really done well for yourself. Particularly considering how how di- dangerous this year's version of the Big Twelve is. Exactly, and in transition, I mean, I really honestly think this team's going to win a couple games. People don't expect them to win too. I mean, they're so close. They've only been blown out once. They lost to Texas. Uh, they didn't get within 10 points in the second half of Texas, but every other game they were in it in the final minutes. So I really think that this is an opportunity for them to win some games, but you're right. The big thing is trying to get this team to mesh. And, you know, one thing Long Kruger didn't have that Porter Moser does is the transfer portal. What's that going to mean? I mean, can you, can you count on going high school and getting high school kids to come in and build your team that way? Or do you have to stick with this portal? You're going to have players coming and going. And I think Porter Moser is going to have to navigate that moving forward. Uh, he may lose a player too and, and try to find someone to fill some spots. So it, it, after this year, it's going to be interesting to see, is he going to lean more on high school kids? Or is he going to go transfer portal? Because that's dangerous. If you get into transfer portal, then it, it becomes an every year thing. You can't break out of that. that yeah. Move. Again, compared to Kruger, what Lon did was, again, it was a mix. He Ahmad Embai transferred in, transferred in from uh, his old conference. I think it was the Mountain West at the time. Might have been the WAC. I can't remember. And then uh, they got Tayshawn Thomas to transfer over from Houston, transfer up from Houston to mix with the class that included Isaiah Cousins and uh, and Buddy Heald. Yeah. Kruger got fortunate with Heald. That doesn't happen every every year. Uh, Moser's going to know, but Moser's going to have to find that that that's a similar touch. I think to uh, to really advance the program. Real quick before we finish up, softball. Got to throw this out. Oh, uh, you number one ranked in the which version of the poll was it? Uh, gosh, I can't remember. Well, NCAA. So I can't remember. Them. I can't remember. It was a poll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> number one, and that was expected. But you 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 noticed something that was a little unexpected, did you not? This is the first year the Big 12 has done a preseason team. They've never done one. And it's kind of unique because they don't do it by position. They just say, tell the coaches, uh, basically pick 12 players. You can't pick any of your own players and go from there. And uh, while Tiara Jennings was a unanimous pick, Jocelyn Allo, the home run queen, uh, the one who's going to set the all-time NCAA record for home runs in a career, was not on was not on the list on someone's ballot. They were they she made the all conference preseason team, but she wasn't a unanimous selection, which means there was an opposing coach somewhere, and we'll never know who, who did not make Jocelyn Allo one of her, their top 12 picks in this league. And it's hard to believe she is not one of the top 12 players in this conference. That has to be an after that that's gotta be an oversight. <laughs> You'd hope, but then you hope it's not a little pettiness from a coach saying, you know what, all she does is hit hit balls, she doesn't play in the field. Uh, I'm not going to vote her. You don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was an oversight. You know, we need to get oh. that's that. But man, if it's not, there's some there's some ammo for for not only Jocelyn but for the whole team. You're going to cover a lot of softball. Something tells me before the end of this uh, calendar year or this uh, school year. Um, besides your work with uh, football and basketball, it's going to be a it's going to be a crazy year in Oklahoma. OSU is ranked third in that same yeah. preseason top 25. Just crazy. All right. So keep an eye on softball for us. You're going back to Norman tomorrow, right, to see the Sooners and Bears? Yes, sir. Down in Lloyd Noble, 2 o'clock Saturday. Going to do that, and maybe, maybe. Next Friday, we'll have uh, Caleb Williams and <laughs> ja- and Jackson Dart's Jackson destination. Jackson Dart, yeah. We'll exactly. see. We'll have see. A good, have a good week, Eric. Good talking to you again. Thanks, Garen. For more information, you can visit TulsaWorld.com.